Hey guys, brand new podcast. Today's podcast uh, is with Eugene Merman. Eugene is a comedian out of Brooklyn, a very talented comedian. Uh, he is the uh, the one of the voices on Bob's Burgers. I, we do not talk about that. So if you're tuning in to hear about that, you've tuned into the wrong fucking podcast. Uh, I've known of you, Eugene for a long time. We run in very different scenes. He is more like the New York now. Now, not even New York. This it's a really interesting story. Uh, I saw a post of his online about a new documentary that he shot called it was all it started as a joke and it was really fascinating a lot of the names in it i were names i was familiar with some of them i knew dimitri martin uh michael showalter uh uh bobcat goldthwaite uh uh mike Birbiglia, and some i didn't know um some and some some are just like very famous comedians that i was like oh my god christian shawl is fucking awesome uh and so I wanted to watch the movie. I did not know what I was in store for. I tweeted him immediately and said, hey, where can I find this? And he sent me a link and he said, you know, you can find it on iTunes. So I bought it on iTunes. I watched it. And I, I mean, within the moment where I sent out that tweet, which was probably a week ago, to the moment I finished watching it, um, I, wa- I, I was stuck to the screen. It's an amazing movie. It is a very, it's a very funny movie. Uh, documentary because it has all these fantastic stand-ups uh, doing stand-up on a festival Eugene will put together at the Bell House in Brooklyn. Uh, so you see a lot of comedy, but then you realize that the underlying tone of this special is more about uh, about life and U- Eugene's relationship with his wife and her battle with breast cancer and her battle with, with cancer in general and the raising of their son, uh, Ali, I think is his name, or Oliver. And and about life and about being a person and about struggle. And it's an amazing, amazing fucking movie that I implore all of you to check out. You will laugh. And if you're like me, you're going to cry. And if you're like me, you're going to fall in love with Eugene. Um, I hope you enjoy this interview. Uh, and that's all I got to say. I hope you enjoy this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Eugene Merman. He's the man. Dude, I love the movie. Oh, I, thank I, you. I really, really love the movie. I loved it for so many reasons. You know, it's it's uh first off, it's funny as shit. It really is fucking hilarious. I mean, who's the guy who's the guy that tells the story about losing his father and his father going you, you Luke Glazer. TV? John Glazer. John Glazer. Oh, John Glazer. God man, he I know who that is. He that was a fucking really great story. Um Yeah. It really is, it really was an a hilarious movie and then obviously at the end i'm so sorry i'm really i'm so sorry for your loss it i was i would i started crying i and i know you guys probably didn't expect that but uh but what so i want to get back i would like to start about the festival itself if you don't mind talking a little bit about that sure yeah so oh, what, is that, what was the I'm sorry impetus, yeah. <laughs> what was the impetus to like to decide to do the festival you know i can't remember i think there was something happening in new york like some sort of festival and I can't remember what it was Um, like meaning like not even a comedy, like just something. And it, for whatever reason made me jokingly think of doing a festival just called the Eugene Merman comedy festival and me and Julie who directed the movie and then also produced the festival and Mike Birbiglia after a show were joking around. And I said, I was going to do the Eugene Merman comedy festival. And, you know, and that was sort of like, I was kidding and we weren't going to do it. And then I think like, days later julie and i were like that would be pretty funny to do like i wonder if that's like possible and uh union hall was opening this new space called bell house um you know in whatever it was at the time like months later and so over a period of weeks i think we just decided to do it and tried to think of funny stuff and you know you know kind of do silly shows and then it was this one-off um thing that we thought we would do and we did like i feel like the like second to last day we were somewhere and ran into like a guy who had like a stretch limousine and we're like would you like to drive people back to the subway from this venue if like if we hire you for four hours or whatever and like we were just doing sort of weird silly stuff and then you know probably sometime like four months after the first festival we were like oh should we do it again like that was pretty fun and then we kind of you know, kept adding things and doing silly stuff. And, you know, I think also that first year, 
Julie, she had been working on, I think a show called wonder shows. And I think that's the show she was working on. Um, and she had met, uh, John Oates. And so she asked him John Oates from like Hall notes. Exactly. So she was (laughs) like, Hey, would you want to be a special guest on this comedy show I'm doing? And so we had like the, like John Oates was our musical guest, um, on like our last show of the first year. And for the, he did basically two songs and some stories in between. And for the first song, everyone thought it was Fred Armisen. And then in the middle, they were like, oh, that's, wait, no, that's John Oates. Like, that's John Oates singing uh, songs. Um, So we just, you know, so sort of the spirit of all that, like, we just kept kind of doing it, you know, year after year. And then at some point, Julie moved back to Massachusetts. And then I did the same thing. And it became clear that sort of like producing a festival where at one point people could basically take the subway or hop in a cab and be at Bell House. and you know, it it was not a big deal. Like eventually it was like, oh, okay, now like you're flying people in and putting them up and, you know, where the whole thing is just this sort of like, I mean, it, it's very fun, but it's also like a, both a lot of work and kind of scrappy. Um, so it was like a lot. And then as we moved, it was like, well, this feels like a little hard to do a festival in another city that we now have to travel to. <laughs> um. I'm curious. I'm, I'm I'm fascinated by what I will I will call the alternative comedy scene. It's it is oddly enough, it's not the comedy I do. I would argue. I would argue. I would very alty, but uh, it's the comedy I enjoy watching probably mm-hmm. the most. Um, and I and I would say that to the passerby, I don't think someone like say I'll say my dad, but my dad would just say funny's funny. You know, like yeah. Bill Burr is just as funny as say uh, John Glazer. They're both. Sure hysterical comics but but i think both you and i know that there is a difference there is a uh, yeah i mean sort of i think it's in a sense like music like in the sense of i mean you, you lots of people like different genres of music but ultimately i kind of i mean i think the way it was always for me is it's john you know, prime versus, i started in kind of the early say it again i was gonna say it's like john prime versus hank williams jr <laughs> Yeah, versus a different like a uh, psychedelic folk rock. I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, know yeah, why yeah. It doesn't matter like the idea that somebody was like, I only like Pink Floyd, and if it's not Pink Floyd, I don't <laughs> like it. Like that seems <laughs> like a crazy person to me. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, when I started doing comedy, which was basically the early mid nineties, um, you know, a lot of like the like the like all the comedy clubs that had existed in the eighties. I mean, I was also just like eighteen. Like, you know, a lot of them were winding down with only a handful surviving. And I was in a sort of rural place in college. And so I would just do stuff on stage. And if it worked, it became my act. And if it didn't, I either changed it or got rid of it. And sort of that ethos is what I kept doing. I mean, and still do like where I'll just try a thing. And if it works, great. And if not, whatever. Um, And so you know, that to me is, is what I think a lot of people ended up doing, you know, and a lot of, and I, and I think a lot of people incorporate those things down. I think if you also are like, go to like Edinburgh or go to like the UK and play, you know, places where like, you know, comics draw thousands and thousands of people, they do a lot of kind of stuff. That's like, not like solely, you know, I guess joke storytelling, but still it's like, even I'll do a lot of things that are like, here's the setup. I wrote an angry letter and I bought an ad in a newspaper with my angry letter to a town. And now here's 50 jokes that I'm just, I'm reading, but it's 50 jokes in a row. So it's like, I don't know, think of it as alternative or not. Like, I don't think it matters much personally. Um, Like, I think like Jim Gaffigan is just like an excellent standup who has just like excellent jokes, but he fits in just as much as anybody else. Same as Berbiglia. I think Berbiglia yeah, exactly. is a. I've, I've I saw him at the Tampa Improv. His act doesn't change. It's no. just a stamp of who they are. Yeah. So I think it's just like it's somebody's style. It's what they happen to be. I think, you know, maybe in the sort of transition of comedy clubs partially going away, people moving more to theaters and then spaces that are like, you know, mixed use venues or music venues. Like, yeah, I guess I think at one point alternative sort of impl- like implied uh spaces that aren't comedy clubs because as comedy clubs went out of business people just had to find places to perform and ways to sort of relate um and that kind of created a world and now i think a lot of those people are you know as mainstream as anybody else so i think it's just like you know 
like Nirvana is a very popular band, but people think of it as alternative music. So whatever that is, yeah. is like what you could say about any like Dimitri Martin or whatever. I started I started with Dimitri Martin. We did the same open mic together. Oh wow. Yeah, there Boston Comedy Club. Yeah. The um it's uh so take me back to when you started, because I didn't start until until I was twenty six. I'm forty seven now. But okay. so I didn't start and then when I started, I started in the alt rooms like I say alt rooms, surf reality, yeah, um, Luna, Collective Unconscious, like that's where I would that's the only place I could ever get up, but I really fucking bombed. I mean, I was so bad. And then and then I got a job working the door at the Boston Comedy Club and then kind of found my home there. Yeah. But where yeah. I'm curious because you started at a very interesting time when before way before me, mid nineties is when Janine was kind of coming up and like that and Marin and that was already yeah I mean they were I mean meaning like I was in college so like I literally when I say started I mean like I did a like an I mean I don't know if it was a bringer show or an open mic like at a comedy club in Harvard Square and then I would perform at like coffee houses in college and you went to Emerson right I went to Hampshire College um, oh, Hampshire College, and, and and I went to actually Hampshire College where you could design your own major so I designed a major of comedy and my like final project was a one hour stand up act that I wrote and promoted and produced. And, you know, like I faxed press releases to newspapers and just did whatever I could to make it a thing. And it, and it, and it worked out. And I think that's where like a lot of the things I did there are, are sort of the ethos I took to a career of like trying to figure out, you know, I always found it much easier to create my own space than try to break into what existed. You know, because all I really needed was an audience. Like, all you just needed is, like, 40 people to show up to a thing, and you had a show. That's, um, that, that is, uh, that is, yeah. I mean, I, the, one of my uh, best friends is a comedian, uh, Tom Segura, and his, his, uh, his, his, I remember being in a different path with him than him saying, you don't need the club. You just need people to show up. Yeah. And I could not wrap my fucking head around that. I was like. I mean, like, you could have either. Like, I don't, like, like. Honestly, however you make it, and the ideal probably is some version of both, is like what's fine. I mean, my only goal was to do comedy in whatever way as like a job full time. And so the way I found it to be easier was to make my own things and to have my own shows. And then, you know, and and then doing some of those shows. And then through that, I got a booking agent who was actually a music booking agent. And so I did like a tour with Modest Mouse in Florida. And that was not easy. The but best like, fucking live show I've ever seen in my entire life. Is modest smells. I saw like the holly. That it's the yeah. greatest show, the greatest live show I've ever fucking seen. I like yeah, to the true. point where I have always said, "What's your favorite live show?" Dude, I saw Cold War Kids, and they sucked so bad. They were a studio band that did not move around on stage, all sat in chairs. Fucking modest mouths was so amazing. I want to talk to you about the bands you've opened for because you've opened for my favorite bands ever. But I want to go back to so sure. so so when you started. You started in college. What was your move like to New York? What was? Well, I moved to Boston. Oh, you moved so from oh, you college. Started. I went to Boston, um, and then I did comedy there for a while. Uh, and me and and Brendan Small, um, who did who did the show Home Movies and Metalocalypse, and that's also where I met Lauren Bouchard, who worked at, on Doctor Katz at the time, and eventually made uh, Bob's Burgers, and before that, Lucy, Daughter of the Devil. Um, and so I moved to Boston and there, you know, I started doing, uh, I started doing a weekly show, like at this place in Cambridge on like Thursday nights at 11 PM, but it was, you know, we did it for like nine, 10, 11 months. And it was in a sense, fairly successful. Um, but not as successful as eventually, uh, like the, the sort of Irish music show that replaced it. But then I started doing <laughs> at the comedy studio which at the time was in Harvard Square on the third floor of a Chinese restaurant and now is in in Somerville at like as its own club. But I did a show there every week with Brendan Small and Patrick Borelli. Um, and Patrick now is a writer for, for Fallon and has been for a long time. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we, we did that show and I, you know, there I auditioned for Conan several times over a period of years and, and eventually from there got like, got a set on Conan. I did Aspen, I think in 2000, maybe from, from that, from, from Boston. And, uh, then, and I'd always kind of thought like, maybe I'll get a job in New York and comedy and then I'll move. And then I, it became clear like that is not a thing that would ever happen. 
And that if I really wanted to do comedy, I had to move to New York. Well, New York or LA, but I didn't really know LA. And I'm not even sure if I had a, I might have just gotten a driver's license. Um, so I, uh, so yeah, I, I moved to New, then I moved to New York after like three or four years in Boston. And where did you start going up at New York? Did you, did you, did you instinctually say, let me find the places that are a tad bit offbeat or did you go, well, fuck it. Uh, stand up New York. Uh, uh, I try, I would do sets. I mean, I used to, when I was in college, go to stand up New York to bring her shows. Um, that's, I think, where I first met Bobby Tisdale and 80 Miles and, and Zach Galifianakis. And I and um, I had read about Luna Lounge when I was still in college and went to see shows there. And I would go to Surf Reality. Like, I would take a trip from college or Boston and, like, do a set at Surf Reality at, like, 2 or 3 a.m. or whatever the hell it was, you know. And I would do those things. And then eventually, when I first moved to Boston... So when I first moved to New York, I had... Um, I had already done Conan and Aspen, which wasn't enough for anyone to like me, but was enough to like maybe like do a set on some on random like sort of alt shows that were pretty good. And Patrick Borelli had a show at the Gershwin Hotel, and I would come and do that. Is that the way? Hold on. Is that the one where you had to walk up the flight of stairs in the back? It was like a. It was maybe actual... it wasn't like a high flight, but there was like it was like a hotel or a hostel or something with like and maybe like glass French horns kids. You get like whatever. a ton of French kids in there, and there's a piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, mean, I did that. Do, yeah, so 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 I would just do, you know, whatever I could in a way, and then and then, um, you know, I and and then like through whatever all those sorts of shows, like uh, I had a manager for a little while named Marla Ratner, who before she left um, management, she also worked with the Stella guys, and I got onto like their Fez show, and then from that like you know, toured with them a little bit. And there were just like lots of little things where, but, but all of it involved me trying to have like, you know, a 10 minute set that killed, you know, like I was trying to have a set that you could, you know, that, that, that like, however weird or whatever it was, no, it was something that would essentially kill. And then you could open for people or have a small spot on this show and do well. I'll tell you the three things that strike me right now. And like, and I think for anyone listening, they should know I've known who you are for probably 15, 18 years. Uh, I, I don't think we've ever actually met and I don't think that we've ever run into each other, but I've known who you are. And, 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 and I've, I've, I remember I love, I love your stand up. I just, it's just, it, it really is marches to a beat of its own drum, but not out of, Here's what's here's what's striking me about you. You're someone who has always kind of moved upwards, but you don't look like a fucking networker. You don't look like the typical handshake comic in the back of the room. Hey man, you need an opener, hit me up. You don't look like that guy. You and you're not that guy. I don't I know you're not actually not that guy. And you're Maybe. also what strikes me is that you got I didn't become passionate about stand up until I was doing it. Like meaning I everyone told me I was funny. I tried it and then I was like, "Oh fuck." This is more than what I thought it was. Yeah. And it's it's almost like, you know, getting into uh, viruses and then going, oh, shit, there's all these viruses that like, like, you're like, oh, my God, I didn't know right. that about this. Dimitri Martin was the one that really opened my eyes. And I remember he told me about Attell and Hedberg, and I didn't know anything about that. Now I'm obsessed. And yeah. but but more importantly, you also strike me as and, and this is something that has always escaped me as a guy who's just trying to get your 10 minutes which we all were trying to get, but I always, you're not, you're not, you never, you, you never were doing it out of like, I want to be different. You were like, Hey, this is the way my brain operates and this is all I can make. And yeah. I can't do it differently. Yeah. That's the sort of like I did. I mean, you know, I've done a lot of tours opening for flight of the concords and, and like the last tour I did like now a year and a half or two ago was in the UK at like, you know, arenas, like giant places. And I, and, and I did some of that also here in the States. And I remember doing a show uh, in Chicago, it must've been like 12,000 people or something. And I did an interview and they were like, well, what do you do? Like, what's the stand up you do like on that show, as opposed to like some, like a club or something like that. And, and I mean, I was like, oh, I just do U2 covers if we're playing venues that big. But, <laughs> but also it's like the idea that I have an act that kills for 12,000 people and I refuse to do it for 300 people is so absurd. Like, 
I just I have the stand up I have, and I and and the truth is, in a in a reasonable environment, like once your joke works, it kind of works in most settings. Like, yeah, yeah, would it work with like, you know, very drunk people who are angry? I don't know. I try not like to avoid the worst situation, but in a reasonable situation, if you have a joke that kind of works, it works largely across venues and across spaces and you know the point is you develop a thing that's funny like whenever anyone asks me for advice i just tell them like you should just be funny like i don't know i can't i can think of so few people who have like 45 minutes to 60 minutes that kills that aren't a professional comedian you know what i mean like yeah. like who can get on stage and kill for 45 minutes and then isn't essentially a full-time comic so so i feel like that should be the goal and everything else uh, will come as long as you're like a pretty reasonable, effective person who's not a lunatic. And even that could be a bit of a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> I loved watching uh, Janine's set. I'm, I'm like the first in your movie, uh, yeah. the first person I ever really kind of connected to comedically because I didn't, I never knew, I never understood how to write a joke. I don't, I still have a hard time writing jokes. Um, was Janine. And I love, I watched her, she would say bomb in Montreal one, one year. And it was my favorite set ever. And I was yeah. like, and she was so embarrassed by it. And I went, that's what you do. That's why people like you. Like when she, right. loses well, also, it, I mean, yeah. her set in the, in the film is really it's, funny. Like she it's killed, hilarious. It's really, really funny. She's really funny. And I know that she doesn't think of herself as like a joke writer, but like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's like, I, I guess, except for like she has setups and punchlines and they kill. And if it comes naturally to her, like that's amazing. But it's still a set that that's the thing. A lot of this stuff, like it, it, it kills. Like it's very funny. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, in some of it, yes. Sometimes you watch somebody bomb and it's also very, very funny. But you no, know? but it wasn't even, it wasn't even her bombing. It was just her doing a crowd for an audience that was set up in a warehouse for a taping that wasn't ready for comedy. And yeah. she was fucking fantastic. And right. everyone loved it that was there for comedy. Those people that came in to be on TV, hoping they'd get on TV, that sat yeah. in an audience, they weren't paying attention. Right, I right. love the line right. where she goes, comedy's, comedy's objective. And then she goes, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when did, you, when did that, what, what, was the, what was the first group of comics you met, hung out with, became your tight-knit group? And when did you guys kind of form? Because it seems like you have a great group of friends and like, and comics that are all, in my opinion, the funniest human beings like across. It's very different to be a very funny guy on stage and be able to fuck a stool, which I can do very well. And then take that and make that humor into a television show or an animated series. I'm being serious. You can fuck a stool on, on uh, like for 22 minutes every week and make that a show that is impressive. Uh, Tommy, Tommy John again, Tommy, you know, Tommy John again. Um, of him yeah oh yeah. he is so fucking funny and he wrote uh tweeted last night uh right now there's a stool on stage going wait no one's fucked me in a week <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well there but was when, like when did you guys, yeah I mean, when did you guys so kind for of me like up? there was like boston where i met like you know jen kirkman and brendan small and patrick borelli and, and various comics um, and then comics who would come through like Ron Lynch, who would come to do like Dr. Katz and stuff and then moved to New York. And then some of those same people like Jen and Patrick were in New York and, you know, eventually met like Leo Allen and Dimitri Martin. And then also people who had been doing comedy for much l longer, like, like the Stella guys. Um, Leo Allen made me spit beer out of my mouth in, uh, in uh, Collective Unconscious. Which one did uh, Reverend Jen do? I think Collective Unconscious. Yeah. His joke was, um, the other day my roommate called, and, or my, my, I walked in my roommate said, do you know this joke? My roommate uh, said, not yet. Hey, uh, oh, now I'm going to fuck it up. It was the point was, he goes, I, I told you that your mom called, right? And he goes, no, you didn't tell me your mom called. My mom called. And he goes, no, I did. She said that your dad died. He goes, uh, I definitely would have remembered that. And he was like, no, I did. And he's like, really? What did I say? And he said, you said, oh, my God. And he goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Leo Allen's a guy like like yourself that I know of, like I'm a fan of, I've known yeah. of for my entire career, but never met, really. Just oh, yeah, not he's super funny. Circle. He now lar largely like show runs stuff. 
um, and like he did uh, Nathan for you and is doing another show that I'm sure is on hiatus now. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so, so there was like that group. And then there was also like Kristen Schaal and Kurt Brown all are in Kamel. And then like, you know, I mean it, I think the Kamel's Kamel the action group. star, right? Is that the Say guy again? we're talking about? I mean, yeah. now, yeah, <laughs> but he's a super funny stand up. He's brilliant, man. He's, yeah, brilliant. he's, he's yeah. incredible. Like we toured together a ton and yeah, Kristen. Um, and then like, I think a lot of us would, you know, and Wyatt Cenac and just like over time you meet sort of more and more people and then you, you know, you gravitate towards and hang out with and like work on stuff. And there was also a lot of people like, like Julie Smith, who, who directed the film and produced the festival who I originally met at Tinkle, which was the show that uh, uh, David Cross and, and Todd Berry and John Benjamin did for, for week for years at the Lower East Side. And Julie worked at, on that show with Lisa Langang, who was at the time worked at like NBC and then Comedy Central as like an executive. And so like there were all these friendships that you would form with people who you naturally gravitated towards to work with. That's um, crazy. Yeah. And so now, that's you, sort of, yeah. Do you still, do you still drink? Um, uh, yeah, not. But were, not you ever, were you ever a big boozer? I would say like I drank a lot like in my, in my, 20s um but i mean i have a kid now and i don't like don't go out yeah. and stuff so like, i got two kids i still fucking booze the uh I, I i haven't drank in 21 days on this fucking quarantine but that's just for, just because it's awkward to be the one guy drinking jack at your house the, yeah um, yeah so um now what were your parents like well your parents are both russian correct yeah and i am like i was born in russia you were born in russia moved when you were four so I'm, I mean, obviously I have a huge tie to Russia. So I'm curious, what was the, where were you, where, where did you guys move initially? And where were you from initially? I want to know everything. I want to know fucking everything. Like who came? Why did you come? Like, did, did your grandmother come? Like, what, I mean, eventually. Play? So like we, so in, uh, you know, like basically I was four, like me, my brother and my parents immigrated to America. Older or younger? Um, so, uh, older. Uh, okay. Six years older. What's um, his name? Yevgeny. Yevgeny. Yevgeny is one of my Or Zhenya is what my Russian name is, and uh, um, or the formal is Yevgeny. But uh, my drivers, one of my my Uber drivers, Yevgeny, and we talk in Russian in the car. My Russian's horrible, but uh, okay. But I love. It's one of my favorite names, Yevgeny. Yeah. So so we came, and the way you do it is so so um like you go from you i think like you get like you get permission to leave russia there was like basically a window where like to appease america i think russia was letting jews out and so we were fortunate enough to be part of that sort of window and you go from russia to i think austria for a few weeks and then from there you move to a town in italy for like four months five months and then eventually you go to uh, america or or whatever country like, I think initially when we were leaving, maybe the idea was that we would go to Israel, but mm -hmm. not really. Or like, maybe that's like, you need an invitation. So we had an invitation from my dad's sister to come and like reunite a family. But my mom's uh, uh, brother was in America. And so we, we ended up coming here. Um, however fun it would be to be Israel's greatest alternative comedian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, then we came here. Uh, where did you, where, where from in Russia? Mo Moscow. Oh yeah. And uh, then, then, and then, what, and then, and then we got, and then we lived in uh, Brighton for a year and a half and then moved to Lexington, oh. Mass. Okay. Um, uh, what now, what was, um, what, you, this is before the wall uh, dropped. Oh, yeah. The yeah. This is like, like 79, 80, 79, 80. Yeah. Holy shit. You have, do you have any memories of Russia? I don't remember Russia. I think actually the only memory I have, uh, in a sense is the smell of black currant. Cause at some point I was like, Oh, this is really familiar. And my mom was like, Oh, we had like black current, like, uh, bushes in, in basically our dacha, which was actually like, I think, a, um, um, like basically built on, it would have been like a swamp or mud, but my grandmother figured out how to like drain it. Cause her and my grandfather were like en engineers. Really? And so yeah. your dad was an engineer in Russia? My, my dad was, but my grandfather, my grandfather like built, I think, like he was a, an engineer for the army. I mean, everybody in communism works for the government, but uh, he built, I think, one of the two airports in Moscow that's still there. And also maybe like a lot of like big buildings there. 
Um, and my grandmother run, ran like, I think rubber production for Russia. Wow. And so your, your family obviously wasn't fans of Russia there, right? Or were they thinking there were just, a, it was a better opportunity to move here? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's in general, I mean, like, yeah, I think in general, Jews and communism each in their own way in Russia just was like, not great. And so, um, I, I think, I mean, like our phones were tapped, like at some point my mom was on the phone and as she was hanging up, she all of a sudden heard a high pitched re rewinding sound in the conversation she had just had, like, you know, in high speed. Um, and, and that could have been anything from an accident or like a, a way to scare somebody. And I know that, uh, like our home was searched because they thought my dad had books he wasn't allowed to have. Um, and I think those sort of things together, like freaked out my parents and they, you know, I think eventually decided that it would be better to come here. What was it? Were you aware of the transition that your parents had to go through now as an adult with a child, were you aware of tra the transition that your parents went through as a kid, like going, God, this must be tough. Or were you just going like, I'm kind of American. I mean, as a kid, I don't know if I fully understood. And it was, you know, sort of the Cold War. And it was sort of weird to be like Russian from the Cold War during the Cold War. But yeah, I mean, I think to a degree, my parents doing that is kind of what made me think that doing something like stand up or like, tr like having a strange goal and attaining it is, is very reasonable. Like, I think that they're like them moving in their, you know, thirties and forties to a new country and starting a completely new life with two children is, is, is amazing. Like, and I know lots of people do it and. It's, I, uh, but it, but you, I mean, both of us can imagine, especially, yeah. you know, things have shifted now, but I can't imagine picking up my family and starting over. It's yeah. over. It's, I, I'm always impressed by, by people like your father and your mother in, from my perspective, because I just grew up straight American, very yeah. much integrated, white American, very much privileged. So the idea that you would come from a different country, not know the language, and then go, all right, guys, we're up and running. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so I've always, so I don't know, I, I can't recall to what degree I appreciated or didn't like the difficulty of that, but I very much like have in the in decades since being a kid, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the time it was like, I was just trying to sort of survive. Um, yeah. Was it tough integrating into schools? Yeah. I mean, I think like at first, uh, I feel like when I entered first grade, I think the teacher was like, who, Oh, uh, cause like, you were the in fucking kindergarten. enemy. You were like, I think yeah, people yeah. That. we thought you guys were robots. Like I yeah, remember yeah. thinking you guys had wooden soled shoes with, uh, like, like really rough pants. Like I remember the, what the way yeah. they taught us about Russians. Yeah. So I, so, I mean, I think the teacher was like, who went to school last year? And I raised my hand and was like, I didn't, I didn't live in one. And then everyone was like, Ooh, this little weird kid with his <laughs> accent is the enemy. Um, but like when I was in sixth grade, I remember somebody blaming me, uh, maybe third grade, whatever it was like w when, uh, when the Russians shot down the Korean airliner, like everybody was like, you shot down this airplane, like you killed all those people. And I was like, I really didn't. And they're like, <laughs> yes, you did. Um, so there's like a lot of that, a lot of like commie. I mean, you know, so there was, there was like, uh, th though after 10, 11 years, however much it was, like by like 11, 12th grade, like a lot of that stuff dissipated. But a decade of it does wear you down a bit. Um but you know, so yeah, it was, it was hard, but we also moved to a town that didn't have a ton of Russian people. Like we had some Russian friends, I think partially with the hope of assimilating. And, you know, I don't know, like in a sense, I would say it worked now, like decades later, but at the time it was, it was sort of, it was hard. When did you lose your accent? I don't know. Um, I, I have no idea. Like I also, I know that I started speaking English, like there was like a social worker that would come and help and like sort of check on us and how we were doing and progressing. Like this is when we were still in Brighton. And I think like six months into us being in America, like she came and all of a sudden I started speaking English to her and like, everyone was like, how do you know English? Like, I think I was just watching TV and learn English the way like a child, you know, like, you know, yeah. in a sense, like how any like three-year-old weirdly can speak. Do you think, do you think any of that, any of that will rub off on your parenting when you talk to your son and you go, when I was your age, I was learning English for the first time. <laughs> no, no. I feel like everybody has like whatever hardships they have. And I don't think I would ever 
Oh, like, be like, I do it nonstop to my kid. No. I'm I'm a really shitty parent. Like I, okay. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, I yeah. feel like uh, I'm just trying to get through it. So like maybe uh, I don't know. We'll see. Like once he's 14, and he's like my like my cell phone and my you know magic car don't work, then I'll be like, okay, well now you need to cut it out. Is he, um, is he four right now? He's yeah, he's three and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's crazy. That's when you moved to from Russia. The, you, a little bit yeah he's like a little younger but yeah yeah um, starting what, in half a year i'll be like you don't get it <laughs> did you did you did you ever commiserate with your brother how much older is your brother he's six years older oh that sucks yeah it's like i mean we're very close now i mean at the time like you know he would be in like the next school and then like when i was sort of getting to high like high school or even junior high like he went to college like not getting to, but like when I was oh, yeah. in like eighth grade, like he was heading to college. So what were your what like growing up, growing up in I and I I'm I apologize that I keep harping on this, but I, I I'm always fascinated by and and for lack of better words, I'll say an immigrant's journey. Like sure. the, and I, I think our best friends uh, are Vietnamese and our my, my wife's best friend and arguably one of my best friends is uh was was a straight up like had to take a ship here from Vietnam mm-hmm. and was shitting in a bucket and moved to Boston when Boston was overtly racist. Not, not that they're, I love Boston, but overtly racist yeah, yeah. with Asians. Yes. And so I'm always fascinated by the things she sees in life or what her journey was as a child. Because once again, I think it's important for someone like myself who grew up without a ton of struggle to see what struggle was. What was the first band you were like, you were like, Oh yeah, this like you, I'm gonna go out and buy a tape or a CD. Or oh, a- that was probably Aerosmith. I mean, I was in Boston, and a lot of the music I got was through my brother. So it was like a lot of classic rock. Um, I mean, it's also funny because like at the time, it's a band that's like nine years old. But if you're like <laughs> 10, twelve years old, you know what I mean? Not even yeah. like meaning. Yeah. There's something really funny now to be like oh i was into this old band and it's like that band (laughs) like started a handful of years ago and they took like a three-year hiatus like you you like you know uh so anyway yeah i think it was uh could have been eras but done with mirrors could have been maybe before that i mean it might have been some of their earlier stuff actually Um, jay giles jay giles was mine okay yeah, Jay Giles. Um, the first album I ever bought was Juice Newton, like Juice Newton playing with the Queen of Hearts. That was like my song. And mm-hmm. then, uh, and then Jay Giles was the first tape I bought. Like I went out and bought a tape. I was a big fan of Kiss though too. Yeah, I had like a uh, t- like a tape that I'd tape stuff. I think off the radio, but I, which had like, I think, uh, God, maybe Money for Nothing. I think like Van Halen's, maybe California Girls, and I think oh, like. And maybe born in the USA. Like I think it was like three songs. And then I also had a tape of like Russian folk music, and like mostly that's what I would listen to. Ah uh, man, when I was in Russia, uh, I learned a, to play a lot of Russian folk music on the guitar. And uh, oh really? Oh yeah. And I oh, and wow. it was one of my, it was one of my favorite things ever. And I wish I, there's one song that was such a great fucking song. I wish I still remembered it, but I don't. Um, was did your brother have a, a strong accent considering he was six years older? I mean, as a kid, I don't really remember. Like right now, we don't really have accents um do you talk in russian to him uh we talk in english but when we're with like my parents or other people who like speak russian more than english then we speak in russian are your parents both still alive yes oh nice in in same same town uh no they moved to uh newton um but they're like in the same area they left like they had a house and they're like in an apartment which is much easier and did your dad drink no not really i mean like holidays yeah 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 because I, I feel like every Russian man I knew drank hard as fuck. I feel like, I mean, I mean, I'm sure that that is like, like. But yeah, there's, yeah, that's, it's a broad stroke of going like every Russian's an alcoholic. Yeah, I feel like the, like my parents, friends, not particularly, like not to say that like there wouldn't be like, you know, holidays and people would do. I mean, there's like a, like what what I remember much more of is like people doing like small like not shots like the way you would think of it but like much smaller in a sense of like sort of doing toasts there was a there were like 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 20 holiday 26 traditional toasts and that we used to do i think yes and it was like it was like all night long and it was just another one and but they were real tiny 
Yeah, so it's that, but like, there's no bars in the town I grew up in, and no one went to bars, and and like, no one like, um, yeah, I guess like, I I don't know, like, I can't speak to it, but but offhand, I don't think that that like that was never a thing for my parents or like their friends that I was aware of. Yeah. Offhand. Yeah. Okay. What um <clears throat> so so bef- when when you, you met your wife, you were living in New York, correct? Yeah. And yeah, how- she actually grew up in the town I went to college in. Oh, for but real? Yes, but we met in New York. Yeah. Oh, okay. Have was ever a thought of moving to LA? I mean, in a sense, I'd say not really. Like, meaning, I, I always kind of figured that I would stay in New York or potentially move back to Massachusetts. Um, we'd considered it, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been important possible but i think also like as she got sick it seemed like that would make no sense and it made much more sense to move home and be near family (laughs) um but i in terms of a career like i could you know everything i wanted to do i could do in new york and now largely a lot of what i want to do i can do in you know either somerville or here in cape cod um and so you know it's like i can record i record bobs out of boston from a studio we we record in three cities at the same time where we're on. Oh, do, you do, do you do it live? Yeah. We do it live. Yeah. So that's, so we actually do it all together live. Yeah. Which is not, I think a common way to make a TV show, but yeah. It really? So now who, who created, who created that show? Was that, uh, Lauren Bouchard. Lauren Bouchard. I keep, I keep going back to John Benjamin. Yeah. So he's, so he's, I mean, he's been in every project of Lauren's. Yeah, I believe, but um, he's yeah, a fucking but, fascinating dude. He's really, really funny. But, but like Lauren, actually, so when he created the show, we worked on this like eight minute demo for I don't know two years or something like that, like going into the studio, recording and re-recording, and then like after literally like working on this thing for years, Lauren called us and was like, "It's been picked up. Like we're making. I think at the time it was nine episodes, maybe maybe thirteen. I forget." Um. And so we got picked up for a very small number of episodes and, you know, started, started doing that. That's uh, that's yeah. My daughter's uh, my daughter, Isla loves it. And I, well, I, I sat down one day and I'm watching it and I go, God, I recognize these voices. So I yeah. go on and then I'm like, shut up. These are all the fucking comics I love. Yeah. It's all largely standups and a lot of the guests often are too. What was, the, what were the projects you did that got away from you? Like meaning, the ones that you did that you're like, God damn, it was so good and no one got it. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't necessarily even look at it that way. But, um, you know, I did a pilot for Comedy Central that had a lot of really funny stuff that like if it had become a TV show, I think would be would have been a pretty funny sort of odd TV show. Um, Do you feel like the industry has gotten you? I mean, sh- sure. Like meaning like I don't even... I get to make the things I make and then, you know, like I made a super weird album five years ago, but it's recouped. So I don't know. Sure. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, I feel I, like, I feel like some of us, some of us, when we start, you get put in a box of what they see you as and what, and what they expect out of you. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I always wonder like if you could, if you, if guys like yourself, John Benjamin, John Glazer, Dimitri get forced into a box of, cause you are so original you get forced into a box where you can't just bring in something that is just really funny. It's got to be like, and then they all live in an eyebrow, you know? Right. Well, I feel like I do remember people very early on, like in 2000, 2001 being like, Oh, you're funny, but I have no idea what to do with you, but that's fine. Like they don't like everything ended up, you know, so much like changed in terms of like the internet and how much content there could be in the world and that you could make your own podcast. Again, I always found it easier to make my own things. So it's not like I needed someone to be like, okay, how can we make a show where you're like an off kilter neighbor? It's just more like now I, you know, I uh, am on various projects and a lot of it is also friends like Concords was that I met them and they wrote me in as Eugene (laughs) into their show. And same with like Glazer with somebody who was, you know, do like uh, around doing a lot of stuff, and then when he made the show Delocated, you know, I played like a hitman in this like short little five minute demo, and then it sort of like developed, and and then I was sort of part of that show. But the a lot of it time, was, like, the whole time I watched John Glazer tell that story about his dad, I couldn't see his face because of his hat. Like yeah. I kept yeah. looking for. I go, who the fuck is this? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so so I think like I don't I mean, yes, people obviously get pigeonholed. And I think if I was like auditioning for a lot of stuff and and that's like there was something I really, really wanted um that I wasn't getting, maybe that would be very frustrating. But like for me, I wanted to make this festival and a movie about it and I've made pilots for stuff and wrote a book and done a lot of albums, but I feel like a lot of the projects I wanted to do were just sort of projects I wanted to do with friends. And then if somebody wants to cast me in a thing, that sounds pretty good too. But I also remember like doing, you know, you know, being in New York, doing stand up and being broke and like doing auditions for random, you know, sometimes it would work out. Like I was briefly in an, I was in an episode of third watch, I think in the very, in the first few years of being in New York, and uh like when i was i was temping still and then i got that um but i remember doing some audition it was like a commercial and the audition was it was for some dvd game like that's how sort of old it was it was for a game that was on dvds and the character when i showed up when i looked at like the sides the character was a cross they were looking for a cross between jack black and robin williams and I was just like, it was like musical genres and endless characters. And I was just like, this is like, I can't believe I've taken like four hours or whatever it is to like come and be a part of this. Cause there's just no version where this is like, this is a terrible use of a way for me to like make any money. And so I, I think I, and that was also like coinciding with, some of the things like touring with Stella or like doing shows where like when I went with Modest Mouse and could make like a few hundred dollars from a show, like, you know, once, once I could make like enough to basically cover rent, that, that was like a big turning point for me. What was it like? Uh, Stella, by the way, I was a huge stan- fan of the state. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, did you watch the state in college? I did. I did. I watched the state in college. Yeah. And so when I started doing those shows and touring with them, that was incredible. That was so, so wait, and, were you, when you, you know, Joe Walter and I toured a lot together and he um, was, you know, one of the producers of the movie and, and helped guide us a lot. Um, but yeah, so they when, were, when you met them, were, did you, do you have, I get awestruck. I get, I get, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starstruck by people. I, I can't help it. I, it's, yeah. I'm very, na- I, I just did an interview with Adam Sandler. <laughs> And I completely shit the bed. Like, it really fucked it up. But did, when you meet someone like the state and you're young and you just moved to New York and they and they like what you do. do it was you, very, very exciting. Yeah, I was are you, very are you like, cool in that moment. Do you get I think it just depends. I think largely fine. I think I sort of separate the two things, but 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 very excited. Um, I think it just depends. I don't. Yeah. Um, what's, I your don't favorite, know. what's your favorite state sketch? Do you remember? I I don't know if I remember. Oh, I have like a list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I haven't so, seen it in a very long time, but it was something I watched like religiously in college. But that admittedly is, I think, like now the mid nineties. God, it's so far fucking long. It was like it was the first. I would say it was my int- it was my introduction into comedy in that in that. I I did not I did not find what Comedy Central was putting on su- super funny at the time. I right. found it well, very. Go ahead. Well, the state was, I think, MTV. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Comedy yeah. Central was doing stand up at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't get that. I didn't. I, I didn't find. I found SNL funny, but it was like you know Sandler Farley. Of course, I found them funny. The state was the first thing where other people weren't laughing in the room, but I was dying, and I right. couldn't understand maybe why. They, maybe they had a sketch about eating Muppets that was really funny. Oh yeah, yeah. Show me far away. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the scary Muppet shows up in the wind. By the way, I can quote every st- skate sketch yeah, yeah, yeah. ever, yeah. like ever. He was like, they're like, what are we having for dinner tonight, Bill? Well, we're having Muppet. Wait, what Muppet? How do we get Muppet? And he goes, it's very easy. I'll show you. I'm having a hard time with my ABCs. And then the Muppet shows up in the window. Oh, did you say? I mean, dude, I, yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, it was, it just was one of those things. And then I met them in Greece randomly. Oh, wow. um, yeah, we were backpacking through Europe. And I met David Wayne, who to this day thinks I played volleyball with him. I have no idea what he did with some guy that he played volleyball with. But man, that guy left a dent on his psyche. He's like, we played volleyball together every fucking time I've met David Wayne. Um, And then worked with Michael uh, Ian Black. Um, I I, I met Thomas Lennon. And I, I really haven't met many of them. But worked with Jim Sharp, who was one of the EPs on that back in the day. And I just geeked out. And then Jim Sharp sent me like a whole catalog of everything they had. And I was like, 
in fucking. So what about, tell me about my other favorite, one of my other favorite fucking bands, Modest Mouth. What was it like touring with Modest Mouth? Um, well, it was both, I mean, you know, it was, so it was right before Float On. It was like the tour preparing for Float On, for like, the, they were, you know, in a sense about to blow up. Um, it Did was, you open it, for them when I saw them? Did you open at the, was it at the Greek? No, 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 no. So this is probably before that. Like, okay. that's what I'm saying. It's like the album hadn't released. We did something like 11 or 12 dates in Florida. And, uh, you know, weirdly, something like, I don't know, six or so of the shows were actually really fun. And then like three or four were hard. And then one or two were like, w- were were just like, there was like one or two that were really difficult where like people were just like yelling and like kind of crazy and it was really hot. But, you know, it was it was pretty fun. And it was it was a lot of like, trial by fire where like i was you know i also had video and stuff i kind of did a lot of things where i thought like well people won't yell at a funny video and i and i was right people like i would do some stand up and show video and do some more show video and like it it ended up working out pretty pretty well um it was pretty fun they were very sweet um yeah did you did you get a cocktail and watch the shows oh yeah yeah yeah. it was really fun yeah yeah it was great and they were also like all like sort of two to 500 seat clubs. Like it was all pretty small, like maybe closer four or five or something. But, but yeah, it was like this small tour to get ready for a bigger tour and what inevitably Holy was shit. a really big album. And so you, were you listening? I mean, this sounds crazy. Were you listening to that album they were about to release? There was that what they were playing? I, yeah. I mean, that's what they were playing along with a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Um, How cool, so that man. was really fun. I mean, and that was all through an agent that, that booked them the time and then, and was like, she had actually, she used to go to those tinkle shows um, and uh, she was like one time she was like, Oh, would you want to open for the shins at Bowery ballroom? And this is like, I don't know, 2002 or whatever it was. And I was like, yes, I would like to do that. Except then the funny part ended up being that like, you know, I wasn't listed. So it was something like one or two bands opening. And then the shins were supposed to go on at 11. And then instead I came out to do 10 minutes of stand up. And people were like, what the fuck is this? Like, <laughs> and, and they were sort of this like, good got some ideas. And, and then, yeah. And then like, they were sort of heckling. And then I was like, and then I think I said something like, I can't believe I'm being heckled by people who could get beat up by Bell and Sebastian. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of really turned everyone and they were kind of, oh, okay, like this is, this is funny. And then they, they laughed. And I probably also showed a video. Like I probably did like seven minutes of stand up and showed a video and they were like, all right, that, that was fine. Um, so, so yeah. And then from there I started working with her and did for a long time. She was really great. Really great. What other bands did you work with? I mean, th- that was like a lot of what I toured in terms of like through her, but then there's like, you know, I mean, unrelated to that, like Yola Tango would do these Hanukkah shows and have comics on their shows. And they also did a, they did a tour of, um, what's it called they did uh, a tour of swing states with like different musical guests and comedic guests and so i did like a leg of that for like a week or two um i the, the first album i put out on the seattle label suicide squeeze um uh i ended up what well, i have that, that album i have that album what album is that uh absurd nightclub comedy yeah i have that album and then uh john mccray from cake had heard it and he asked me if I wanted to then host their like th- their sort of tour with him with Cake, Gogo Bordello, and Tegan and Sarah. Gogo so Bordello, I did a thing where I emceed that tour, but I would mostly like do stuff up front a little bit, you know, be- between like the the first and second band, and then by the time like it was like Cake was coming on, there was no like I couldn't do stand up. Like if I would go out, people would just chant Cake. And so I would just go out and introduce cake, but, but I could, but you could do stand up up front, you know, and there were things like that, that like you would sort of learn as you did these things. And and then I've done like, you know, I did a tour with Robin Hitchcock, which was more of like a split bill. Um, Cause he's somebody that I've really loved for a long time. And, you know, occasionally, and then I've, there've been other bands um, that I've done uh, that I've done stuff with. I don't do it nearly as much now because also it's uh, it can be hard. To, to, to do like it's but um it can also but at the time also it was really both fun and helpful you know i sort of was of the mind that you kind of take whatever opportunities you know you can 
and those were also a lot of pretty pretty fun tours. I also did a tour with Andrew Bird, and that was really great because his audience was really lovely. Like we would be in kind of you know mid sized theaters, sort of between one and two thousand people, I would say, and um, and the, his audiences were just really sweet. What was the tour you did with Marin and um... Kindler? Kindler, yeah. That was uh, Mar- I think Kindler wanted to do the stand upity tour. Stand upity tour. Um, and so it was the three of us uh, driving around with them at the time, arguing who would who would tank their career more. That was that was like every day. It was like five hours of them debating. And now, years later, it's obvious it was Kindler. <laughs> Your career, it's, you know, the one side... I'll, I'll Mark's speak. punishment is that he's really, really successful now. <laughs> yeah, Mark's punishment is that he gets recognized. <laughs> um, the one thing I find fascinating, and 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 not to go back, I think, I think we can acknowledge this, I think fans may acknowledge this, is the differentiation between what I guess they would call bro comedy or what I do. I don't know what, I don't know what alternative comedy calls what we do, but it's, it, there is a difference. You obviously... You, I mean, I'm sure you know that there is two. It yeah. is like two different scenes. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, I know that there's lots of different scenes. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but I one of the things that I've always been uh, jealous of is like just how enmeshed um, scenes like uh, the alternative scene. I, I guess I'll use that for lack of better words is with music because man, you you guys have just been dialed into like my favorite. Like Jeff Tweedy has Fred Armisen. Yeah, uh, and obviously I know Fred Armisen and Jeff Tweedy have history like that. He yeah, work but also them. like that's another band like you know. But also Wilco, I remember when Wilco played like was the musical surprise guest on a Tinkle show, and then eventually when they started Solid Sound, they had Hodgman book you know comedy, and they have like this comedy component of it. I think it's just also a lot of people sort of liking each other is, is yeah is basically a lot of it. I remember we, my tour bus driver uh, was Jeff Tweedy's tour bus driver. And he was mm-hmm. like, yo, we're in Chicago. Uh, why don't we, why don't I call up Jeff Tweedy and see if he wants to come out to a show? And I was like, nah. He was like, why? I said, I don't need my favorite musician to not like me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think I'm going to pass. And he was like, for real? I go, yeah. I was like, I, I know what comedy he likes and I don't do anything like it. And I, the, I'm, I mean, I can't imagine him seeing me take my shirt off and being like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> you never know. But it's 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 always been a fascinating fascinating component of like uh of what was it Robin Wright Penn is that who uh who who's the woman that sang one? One is the loneliest um I don't know, but I believe you. I thank you. I just happen to not know. Uh, she's she's big at Largo. She goes out and does Largo all the time. And you're like, mm-hmm. all these great musicians have always been drawn to these comics that I'm I'm a big fan of as well. But it's uh, I've always been yeah. like, like, like pounding my drum, going like, when like when uh, what comic what like hip hop guys uh, our fans are. <laughs> like the interesting- maybe Sting likes you. Is that helpful? No. <laughs> I, sadly, I'm past the point of needing anyone famous to like. I was that was like my my feather in my cap was to get like a famous fan when I was younger. Uh-huh. I think I approach this business very differently than you did. I think I'm where I'm now where you are, where you were uh, when you started. Meaning, when when I started, I wanted I wanted to be accepted. I didn't. Mm-hmm. I want. I just wanted to be accepted. I think that was what was so difficult for me mm-hmm. in places like surf reality and collective unconscious was that I, I very quickly was not accepted. And it was like, oh. I was the guy that was like, like just looked at like, I, I you don't, you don't belong here. And it was, I would, I would say, I would argue it kind of was a strain on me and Dimitri's friendship because Dimitri very quickly was accepted by everyone. I mean, I want to say like real quickly, he was like on tour with somebody and I was, and I felt like I was the friend hanging out, and kind of keeping him back. Like I would go to the bar and hang out with him, have beers, and you could see Dimitri very quickly networking and making friends and talking about other shows. And I was just this other comic. And I was like, you know what? I got to do my own thing. I can't just be going to open mics with guys. I got to be the guy that goes to open mics by myself. Like I can't be like, yeah. oh, where's where are these guys going? I'm going to go with them. 
and uh, and then and then still very, you know, frustratingly, I think spent my time trying to get club owners to like me and doing funny bones and improvs and trying to get approval through the industry. And it was I mean, that's totally a way to have a career. I mean, all I ever wanted is a career. And so the way I did it was the way that seemed to make the most sense and and also put the most control in my hands. So like I I didn't do that. I I getting always gave other people control. Yeah, yeah. So I guess for me it was like getting on TV was hard, but like making your own album with a small indie label and making your own like website and you know, all these sort of different things, like that stuff you could control. Like you could make a video and put it online. Yeah. Which is, you know, what I did, you know, like in the late nineties and, and early two thousands. And those yeah, I didn't do that. Sort of went didn't do around because that it was just like what can you do? And that's what I would do. So it was just, you know, a lot of times people would be like, oh, like, would be like, oh, you're playing like rock clubs because it's, you know, cool or something. And I'd be like, yeah, but also they pay way better than comedy clubs. And you can do like one show instead of four. Like, it I also did not, just simply makes sense if you can get a hundred people to come, you know, then you're in just a better place. Your split is just better. Um, and then you can kind of survive. So that's sort of a lot of what I was doing was basically whatever like made sense to sort of survive or a way to make money and also was enjoyable. Yeah, I did not do that. I did. I I was under the impression of if a tree, I think you looked at the careers, if a tree falls in the woods, it still falls. It, and it doesn't matter if no one hears it, it's still falling and it fell. I was like, well, no, people got to see it fall in order to know it fell. So I need the industry to approve of me. And I need to book TV shows and pilots. And, and I think yeah. I, I was, I was caught up in that so badly until I got, until I lost everything. And I was like, I was like, fuck it. I, I'm the only one that's paying the mortgage here. I'm the only one that's, I'm the only dad in this house. I'm just going to do it my own fucking way. And I think that, I mean, if anyone's a comic listening to this, I would definitely follow your path before following mine. I've fucking 15. I'll give both a try for a decade and I bet it'll be fine. <laughs> Segura was your path. He was like, he was like, fuck the clubs. I remember being, being like, where are you getting this confidence from? Well, I don't even think like fuck the clubs. I just think like if you, like if that's where you're, you know, if if like you're getting stage time. Like I remember people being like, I already have a low energy wordsmith, and I was like, I, like I don't know what you're telling me. I just want to do comedy. Like so, a if, low energy wordsmith is like, that what they said? I think somebody said it. I couldn't tell if I think they were actually maybe talking about Dimitri already. Like they were like, I already have that. And like, what I need is, and I wasn't even exactly that. It was just sort of this odd thing. And I think they were just like, I don't get, like, I know you were on Conan, but I don't get how, what you're doing is comedy. Even though like, to me, I was like kind of doing set up punchline, just a little weird or a little different, I guess. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's, it was also fine. Like I ended up finding my own path. And I think that's just, that was it wasn't even that the other way wasn't possible like could i have maybe developed a set and maybe like broken through into some clubs or something like that like possibly but it of course i think you're talented it matter like it was yeah. i guess i just didn't think it mattered and and in a sense you know that would bore out to be true yeah i wish i had i wish i had hung out just a little longer with dimitri and listened to people as opposed to try to be heard does that make sense yeah, though it also seems like it worked out fine for you. So it's sort of like, I don't know, whatever career, like the goal is sort of to start doing comedy and 10 to 15 years later, be a comic. Yeah, you know? right. And so like, I don't know, whatever way you learn that sounds fine if, you know, if you start in a sense young enough. And you're 40, 43? I'm 45, yeah. 45? Yeah. Does, Thank um, you. So no, I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, I've always been jealous of your hair. Thank you. Thank you. I always wanted I wish to... I wish it was fake and I could just like clip it off, but no. <laughs> it's the greatest head of hair. And it's got a great your back corner always here always looks like you just woke yeah. up. Yeah. In the pandemic you can't get much of a haircut. <laughs> oh, you're telling me. Yeah. So um so what's what's next for you? What I mean, what what do you plan on doing next? As a fan, I'm excited to see what you do next. Um, I mean, I I plan to work on more like sort of projects with um, uh, my friends that I made my last record with and do maybe some like kids things and also just like more kind of, uh, 
you know, weird audio projects. And then also write a new hour of stand up as well as um, I'm working on like an animated show with, with a, a few other friends. Um, I might try to do another book. I don't know. Like I, right now I'm like literally just trying to get through the pandemic. Um, yeah. So, so it's sort of, you know, I'm kind of trying to just have my like life have order and a, a bit of a routine and then we'll focus more on comedy stuff. 2020 has uh, been a fucking dick show for you so far. It, yeah. It's not the, it's not like the, the be- best year, but also I just like, you have to sort of get through it. So, yeah. Right now I'm just trying to get through it. So it's not like there's anything, I don't know. I mean, I have things I'd like to do things I'd maybe be working on to try to like create a semblance of like, you know, normalcy, but, uh, so we'll see, but yeah, working on projects with friends, which is largely what I do in general. I ha- I used to have a podcast with audible that was really fun to do. So I would con- like, I might try to do a podcast again, but again, in like years down the line, um, I might try to help like, uh, other comics put out records and things like that. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'd love to, I mean, I, I know it's not, uh, I know that you probably have a lot on your plate, but I would love to hear a podcast by you. I mean, it's, I, I would say, you know, the closest I've ever, the closest I've ever gotten in my career to, you know, being where you were when you started, where you said, fuck it, I'm going to do this myself was my podcast. It's one of the greatest things I've ever, I've ever done. I'd have three now. I have four technically, but, um, I, I love the do it yourself. I love that. No one can take it away from you. I love that. Yeah. And I wish that that, I mean, I feel like that is the one takeaway from this interview is like, I wish I had done that earlier. I wish that I said like, I'm going to make this happen myself. Yeah. But you also like did, I mean, yeah, sure. Like it's just, it just took me a long fucking time to go like, Oh, so that's what this is about. I can make a video and then sell tickets through that video. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Um, are you, are you parenting? Are you by yourself now? Do you have help? Um, I, I mean, uh, I, ha- yeah, I do have, I have, uh, I'm quarantined with my son and then, uh, also like my nanny is at her home quarantined with her daughter. And like, so she comes here to help. Like, that's how I can do this. So she comes I and comes, helps yeah. during the week. Um, but yeah, I'm like with him alone a lot, you know, and I get up with him every day and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's very strange. Like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's, yeah, it's strange becoming a single dad and then all of a sudden being like, oh, also now there's a pandemic. Like all the things you were going to, you thought you were going to do to sort of make it through this wow. weird time. You now like can't do any of that. You have to hide in your home with like as much like frozen chicken as you can. <laughs> it's so, got to be, it's got to, did I know that you said in the, in the, in the, in the documentary that nothing's off limits with comedy. What's the, no, and and every and now is the time when you should laugh the most. What's the first joke? Have you written any jokes about being a single dad, being by yourself? Um, don't know. Like like I I might have I I like I was at one point just trying to write down things that were happening and ideas and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I like haven't looked at them in a while. Like I was going to do a show now, like two weeks ago or something like that and that obviously got all canceled as everything did um so i think like i'll probably write jokes and write things about all this stuff you know as like whenever we're allowed to perform again so i don't know july or of either now or 2022 or whatever that's uh yeah i i feel i've i'm panicking when do you think this when do you think this uh fucking quarantine is going to end i mean I think basically like it'll end when we can test enough people that we can control it and we can know who has it, which includes testing asymptomatic people. So I think right now, like the U S is testing like 150,000 people and needs to be testing probably between five and 700,000 a day. Um, and I think once we can do that, like there's no point in reopening anything if like a week later, like we'll have to start over. So we just need to like, you know, I'm hoping that my son can go to school in September. You know, I don't think like, I don't know. (laughs) As a single parent, I'd be like, this better fucking open in September. Well, well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, like say they were to open what, like schools back May 15th for a week. Like who the fuck is that for? Like (laughs) who wants to, 
send somebody to school for five days to see if they can't get a virus. Um, <laughs> like, so I feel like this will end when everyone takes it seriously. And when the, and basically when the government can test enough that we can isolate it and go like, cause, cause right now, like we're about to hit the peak, like in, in hot current hotspots, but rural areas are just starting to get it. And you know, some like, you know, a lot of places like you don't, they don't have like if two doctors get sick, they're fucked. And, and I think like that has to be dealt with in a, like a serious way to save the, save people. And then that was, yeah, that was my problem once, with people leaving the cities was that you're going to a place that has one ventilator. I understand that you have a vacation home there, but if you bring it from the city and, and infect that area, then you are, that, that place has one ventilator. So like now what's, you need to stay put in New York where they have more things to take, take care of more people. I was my problem with it, but I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just like, it depends on the people and like, you know, some people are immunocompromised and like, if they live in an elevator building, like they should try to go and, you know, yeah. be with their parents. So like, I don't, I, I don't, I think like more than any of that, I think like, you know, the government needs to test enough people to control it. So like, you know, and two months ago, we should have started making ventilators and now we should start today or yesterday. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like yeah. whatever mistakes have been made can't be avoided, but like, you know, you could avoid a disaster in June. And if you want to reopen the economy, you have to make sure that like people aren't afraid to go to restaurants. And the only way they won't be afraid is if they don't think that they'll kill their parents if they go. Yeah. So like um, whatever you have to do for that is what I think. So I don't know, two or three months of this, and then hopefully it'll be under control and then it'll resurface in November and um, every few months. Fuck. Uh, I'll get you out of here soon. I know you're, you got a busy day. What, yeah. um, what did you, uh, what, what are your, I have to ask you, and I know that these aren't like, these aren't on brand questions. Are you a Biden guy? Um, I mean, yeah. Meaning what I, what I like, like, yes. Do I, I, I mean, guess everyone's I, a Biden guy now, but I mean, like, yes. were you, I was curious. What were your Biden feelings isn't, all- wasn't my first choice. Um, but I like, I mean, in general, yeah, I feel like I think that, that, um, like the policies, the, like his, he, he, whatever he'll have, like, he'll nominate m- more reasonable, um, like supreme court justices like and judges and he'll take a pandemic seriously like 10 percent of america won't be out of a job because i think he would have listened to scientists and taken it seriously in january and february you know i think like kids won't be dying when they're like like in cages like like i think like there's just, you know, whatever you think of him or his record, I just think like there's certain things that will just like environmental policy will, will, will be better. Like it will be reasonable. Like, will it be enough? I don't know. And, and, but it'll certainly be a move in the right direction. What, uh, were you a Bernie guy originally? No, I, I, I don't like as, as someone from Russia, like that. Was, yeah. Yeah. So like, but, but I also think like the truth is, I think like everyone has to have healthcare. Like, I just don't know if like his solution for that was the solution that I think is best, but I definitely think like everyone should have healthcare. I think like there needs to be a robust, like the pandemic has shown that there needs to be a robust safety net. Like it can't be like this society can't survive off of GoFundMe's, you know, like we, we, we need, there needs to be a safety net. And though he wasn't like my choice, um i think like a lot of the things he said i think like he was very good at fine at at pointing out serious problems but i don't know if his solutions were the ones that i think are are necessarily the best but um yeah either way i think all of it is significantly better than sort of the what what i think is like the huge failure of the federal government under trump you know Who's who's your candidate elizabeth warren um i yes that uh i liked warren um I thought that she um, took like, like she's who I ended up, he, she's who I voted for, though I also like Pete. Um, and I thought that she kind of took a lot of the, I, I think she just had a smarter version, a more effective version of some of the, of, of like a 
of, of a lot of the policies that, that I think if her, help Do you think if her and Kate McKinnon's video had come out two weeks earlier, she would have been a presidential candidate? I, I don't think so. I, I mean, meaning so. like, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I think like, I mean, the, the funny truth of it is, is like with all the people who, you know, um, like, like, like a lot of like Virginia, the person who brought out Un, un like huge new numbers of voters was Biden. Like it, it, it's just sort of like whatever you think he is like like he's the one who inspired people. Like you know, and I think that that's in a sense speaks for itself. Like whether people like him or not, like he's not who I voted for, but um, he he brought he brought the voters. Yeah. Now, um, well, is there anything I left out in this interview? Obviously, I would love I would love uh i i i think many people uh never got the opportunity to meet your wife i would love maybe if there's a way that you could tell everyone about your your wife katie if you can she seemed to be a big a really really big part of your life and and in the movie obviously she's your wife yeah. but uh it's it 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 made me very angry i was very angry at the end of your movie i mean you know i think like she you know, in a sense, she was sort of like the strongest, you know, person I'd um, ever known. She, um, she was just so like resilient, and we made a point of having as much sort of happiness as we could, um, you know, given everything. Um, and yeah, I don't know. She just was such a sort of funny, resilient, uh, great person, and it's you know, so weird and sad and it's weird and sad that like the movie is out and she's not here and like, yeah. you know, but, um, also that was like, kind of like, you know, we knew that it would happen. It just kept always seeming months away or, or more. And then how long, how long did she, how long did she fight? So she had, so she, you know, she, basically she had had cancer like starting like nine years ago, but then, you know and briefly for about a year didn't have it and then it came back and then once it came back for the last six years it was terminal but it was terminal with a lot of possible treatments and she had done you know maybe 15 or so different treatments and and in about a year you know so now like a year and several months ago like you know november of i guess 2019 or so um or no of 2018 yeah. um november of 20 i think 18 or so her like her medicine had stopped working and she was being switched to a new treatment. And she had sort of said, like, do you think this is my last Christmas? And the doctors were like, you know, we, uh, you know, odds are it is your last Christmas, but we'll try to beat those odds. And and they did, they did beat those odds. You know, she lived for another full year. Um, we got to do a lot of great things. She got to spend time with Ollie as him becoming more of a person and like, you know, really interacting and and all that um and then she was on you know a new treatment you know about a year later and it and and again with these things like it takes time so it takes about the same amount of time to know if it's working as to know it's not working and they had always said that you know once it seems like a treatment will hurt you and shorten your life as opposed to lengthen your life like that's basically when you stop and so you know, that's that, that like after she basically went into the hospital and she'd gone in a few times, um, you know, for various things. And we were hoping that she could be made better and then get a new treatment. But it was clear that like, that sort of the symptoms she had were the disease and not like side effects of something. But again, you know, you're sort of doing your best, but, um, so yeah, I, I mean, like, I think just, she was, she just persevered and was, I don't know, like, um, just so strong and, and, and just like funny and I don't know, just like, yeah. It was, uh, it was her, I, it was, she was in the movie at the perfect time at the perfect, it didn't, it didn't overwhelm or, or cut out how funny the movie is. The movie is hilarious. I want everyone to go watch it because it is a hilarious movie about a group of comics that did their own thing and have been doing their own thing 
despite whether or not the industry was paying attention or not, you guys like, and, and I think they have uh, primarily, I think everyone in there is a name that's very recognizable, but it's interesting to know that you guys would have done that had the industry not recognized it. And, and it's super inspiring as a comic, but it's a fucking hilarious movie. The stand up and it's great. The you working on your cancer cards is so fucking funny. You, you not, you bombing with that joke. And I loved, I loved when you tried your bailout that had worked the night before and you missed said it because so yeah, yeah. Many- well, that bailout was meant to be part of the joke. Like meaning it wasn't, it was just meant to be like, yeah. that was the thing. But then the next time it seemed like it was, a, it was so funny that I was like, Oh, I'm pretty sure this is funny. I had eventually, and it's not in the movie, but I eventually turned that into one of the cards and it worked pretty well. Oh, it, but the fact that <clears throat> any comic lit watching knows the oh shit i've said something too early fuck now that's not and then you going back to her my my part that i mean killed me was katie and my wife were identical in the way they received a husband who had bombed and it was like it just wasn't funny yeah yeah, yeah. i was like i mean i I, i i i fell in love with her in that movie and and when she said that i the the candor she had when she said, you know, I'm, my concern is that Ollie won't remember who I am. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. It was, um, yeah, it was an, it was an amazing, ama- amazing movie, Eugene. Uh, and I want to thank you, thank you for sharing that. Cause, uh, I think a lot, I know, I, I don't know if I would have, I think, and by the way, I don't know if I would be able to do what you're going through. I, I think I would be very angry and I might be drunk right now doing this podcast. I don't know. I, you know, well, I mean, I think like, you know, everybody has to do what they have to do. Like, I mean, not that I'm recommending you be very drunk during your podcast. I just mean like, I don't like, I have to be here for me and for my son. In a sense, we're both here for each other. So like, I just can't like, meaning like I have to make him food. I can't like drop food on the ground. That's what I'd be angry about. I'm like, I don't want to cut hot dogs. What the fuck? Well, it's no, it's a good, I think like in a sense, he's as much here for me as I am for him. Like, I, I think, I think, I think we're, you know, helping each other a lot. That's awesome, man. Well, uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I thank uh, you very much for having me, uh, dude. I've been a fan for a long time. It's bummed me out that we've never met or gotten maybe to hang when out. this is all over. Maybe me and Jeff Tweedy could swing by one of your shows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, <laughs> my wife goes, the, what my wife goes, um, uh, I, I'm really bad at interviewing people. And so a lot of times I'll just sit with my wife in bed and go like, I'm talking to Eugene Merman. I'm like, what do I want to say? She was like, well, she, and she always goes, well, what do you want to ask him? I go, I really want to ask him if his wife ever saw the machine story. And she's like, don't fucking ask him that. And I was like, well, no. I don't know what the, what's the machine story. It's a perfect way to end this interview. <laughs> the perfect way to end this interview. Uh, she saw a lot of, a lot of sitcoms. We watched a ton of sitcoms over the last few years. Like oh, like Mary Tyler Moore wrote a new heart was what we were on. Uh, really? Yeah. Watching it all the way through. Yeah. Family ties. Like she would basically every morning she would just plow through different sitcoms. It started like now a few years ago with Dick Van Dyke as her like pain medication would kick in. And then we've watched all of golden girls and so many, and that's like, so that's what we would watch a ton of. Uh, it was very relaxing. It was a very re- nice way to start mornings. That's like a warm blanket for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started every morning with like basically going through some old sitcom and watched a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I appreciate you doing this, man. Uh, I'll, I'll let make sure I spread the word about your movie. If you ever have anything Thank to promote, please feel free to think of me as a as a uh, as a fax machine. Sure, fax I'll machine. definitely let you know in the like. In a few years, when we're allowed to make things again, <laughs> I'll definitely let you know. I think you're. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me on. This was great. This was really fun. Yeah. Thank you. What was a, what was your expectation of what this would be like? Did you I think like, this? I didn't know. I assumed it would be something like what it was. Okay, you're so fucking different than I am. You have no idea. Like I, I like my probably, brain, my brain is always five steps ahead of everything. So I'm always trying to like predict, and you're just like in the moment, like. I thought it was going to be like it was. Yeah. I mean, I, but, but if I would tell you if I didn't think that, like, meaning, like, I just thought it would be a conversation with you asking normal questions and like some joking around. <laughs> um, 
Like, Wait, just out of curiosity, had you ever heard of me before this interview? <laughs> um, I I would say like I've seen. I think I've like seen. Uh, <laughs> like I think I've seen images, and maybe I've seen actually some of your stand up. Like on you know how Instagram will um show just like these random clips or something if you go to the search so i think i've like seen it but but i don't know much um um but but i do know that you you believe you are a broy comic and that you're very nice <laughs> very nice that's all I, that's all you need to know <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll dig deeper if you want <laughs> no you don't need to it was good talking to you brother thank you so it's much you. take all care right. bye bye <laughs>